In this video, we will be exploring some of the deepest, most complex, yet most stunningly beautiful and fascinating things in the universe. From our little old solar system, to the speed of light and space-time continuum, to some of the biggest, brightest, most powerful, mysterious things out there in space. We will explore them all. We will be starting from the top of the iceberg, which is basically just a list. And as we get further and further down the list, the items just get more and more fascinating and unknown. This ice iceberg is custom made by yours truly, as I couldn't quite find one that I really super liked. So I made my own. So give yourself some space and some time, grab a drink, my choice today is black coffee, and join me as we explore the ultimate space iceberg. To start off with in the first tier, there will be entries that you all have likely heard of, but maybe don't know inside out. I made sure to include unique interesting facts about all of them, so without further ado, let's start with a Eight planets. But really quick guys, I would just like to thank my supporters, Ash M and Kelly Scott. Every bit of support from you guys means the world to me, and if you'd like to tip a tea or coffee, there are links to that and the Patreon in the description below. Massive thank you to all who support the channel, and now let's get into tier 1. So these are the 8 planets that along with our sun make up our solar system. Mercury is actually only slightly larger than our moon. It is the closest planet to the sun, and again like our moon is is covered in a ton of craters. Due to it being so close to the sun, it is uncomfortably hot, reaching surface temperatures of around 360 degrees Celsius, which is actually slightly cooler than the London underground system in the middle of summer. Venus is the brightest natural object in our sky, mostly due to just how close it is compared to other stars and galaxies. If you thought Mercury was hot, just wait till you get a feel for Venus. Despite actually being farther away than Mercury, due to its insanely thick atmosphere, about a hundred times thicker than Earth's, a lot of the heat from the sun actually gets trapped on the planet. And Venus's surface temperatures can reach about 465 degrees Celsius, making it the hottest planet in our solar system. Earth. You may know Earth by its other name, home. Earth is blue, green, and white when you get those little clouds on it, and is the only planet we know of so far that has life on it. It has also produced more award-winning Netflix shows than any other planet, and has won Mr. Universe every year since the 1940s. All I'm saying is the rest of the universe needs to step up their game. Mars, also known as the Red Planet. It is known as the Red Planet due to the iron oxide on its surface, giving it a well, red color. Mars is realistically the only planet that we could actually land on and colonize, and there have been, as you probably know, some long-term plans to achieve that. Mercury is too far and too hot, Venus is also too hot, and the gas giants are, well, first of all, they're too far away, and secondly, they are gas. So good luck colonizing a ball of gas. Although if it has natural resources of some kind, I'm sure human beings will try. So for now, it's basically Mars. Mars or nothing. These are the four inner planets in our solar system. Then there is an asteroid belt outside of Mars, and then you have the outer planets in the solar system, which start with Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is a gas giant, with giant being the key word here. I mean, gas is a pretty important word too, because, you know, it's gas. But Jupiter is so giant, in fact, that you could fit every other planet in the solar system inside of Jupiter twice and still have room left over. Now, the makeup of Jupiter is largely similar to that of our sun, hydrogen and helium. It's not large enough to start any sort of nuclear fusion, which is how stars start burning all of these gases. And Jupiter's surface has a giant raging storm that is actually bigger than the entire Earth. And as a bonus fact, it actually actually has the largest ocean in the solar system. Not water mined like on Earth, but an ocean of liquid hydrogen. So pretty cool. Saturn. So Saturn is another one of our gas giants and has a density so low that you could actually float it on water if you found a Saturn-sized bathtub or something. Saturn is obviously well known for its large rings that orbit around it very elegantly and are comprised mostly of icy rock and rocky ice. As well as its impressive set of rings, Saturn also has the most moons of any planet in our solar system, totaling a staggering one 
145. Uranus is very unfortunately named and is actually the coldest planet in our solar system. And that is all I have to say on Uranus. Neptune is, you could say, the blue planet to Mars's red planet. Its atmosphere is around 1% methane, which actually absorbs red light, causing mostly blue light to be reflected back at us. It has the most powerful winds of any planet in the solar system, around six times the fastest wind ever recorded on Earth. But it's really quite beautiful when you look at it from all the way back here. And last but definitely least, we have Pluto. Now, Pluto is not one of the eight planets in our solar system, but it was at one point classed as a planet. Pluto is basically an icy rock with just one sixth the mass of our moon and is roughly half the size of Australia. So yeah, somewhat unimpressive. So you can see why it was kicked out of the planets club and why it will likely never return. A little bonus fact, Pluto's orbit actually crosses past Neptune's orbit. And so for roughly 20 years out of its 240 year orbit, Pluto actually orbits closer to the sun than Neptune does. So those are the planets in our solar system. But we are leaving out two arguably more important bodies that are very near and dear to Earth our moon. So you've probably all seen diagrams of our moon orbiting us like this. Well, forget everything you've learned about that. It is nonsense. This is the true ratio of Earth to the moon to the gap in between them. This gap is so large, in fact, that you could fit all of the other planets in the solar system into this gap. You'd probably cause a few catastrophic issues, like the death and destruction of all life and the planets as we know them, but you could do it if you really believed. Speaking of sizes and scale, I will leave a really, really cool link to an interactive map down in the description below. That actually allows you to scroll through and travel the entire solar system and just absolutely puts into perspective how big everything is and how much empty space there is in the solar system. It's a super cool one to try out. And warning, it will blow your mind. So going back to our moon, it likely came about when another planet, roughly the size of Mars, collided with Earth in the early days of our solar system. Some of the matter from the collision was launched off into space, and this slowly collected in orbit around the Earth, and over many years slowly formed into the Moon. The Moon is what we call tidally locked to the Earth, which means that it spins in perfect synchronicity with its orbit around Earth, meaning that we only ever see one side of the moon. This happened because when the moon was formed, it was irregularly shaped. It wasn't a perfect sphere. And so if the moon was spinning too slow or fast in one direction, the gravity from the earth pulled on it more or less. This gentle tugging essentially aligned the moon with the earth. So now our moon spins in perfect harmony with its orbit and actually causes the high and low tides down here on earth. Pretty cool. Interesting bonus fact, the moon is actually made of cheese. Its core consists of a dense molten camembert and the outer layers consist of a combination of parmesan and mature cheddar. The more you know. Our sun. Our sun is a big bright ball of cheese. Okay, I'll stop. I'm only kidding by the way. Not really cheese. The moon definitely is though. Our sun is a fairly typical sized star, has been around for roughly 4.6 billion years, and without it, we would all be incredibly cold and more importantly, incredibly dead. It is the giver of life, warmth, energy and light for our entire planet, so it's not hard to see why some ancient peoples idolized it and worshipped it. In the form of sun gods such as Ra in Egypt and Huitzilopochtli among the Aztecs. Being made from largely hydrogen and helium with a few other ingredients mixed in there, when this is heated up to the temperatures that we see in our sun, it can contain so much energy that periodically particles actually blow out into space, which we can actually see from 
from Earth in the form of auroras such as the Northern Lights. Its surface is around 5.5 thousand degrees Celsius, so a little hot, and is so far away, 93 million miles to be exact, that light traveling at the speed of light, as light tends to do, takes eight whole minutes to reach us, meaning that if the sun explodes for whatever reason, we would be completely unaware of it for an entire eight minutes, which is just enough time to brew and drink a lovely cup of tea. Oh, and it accounts for 99.8% of the mass in the entire solar system. So it basically is the solar system. Just a quick word from our sponsor guys, who is me. If you are enjoying this video guys, I do weekly videos exploring many many things, from unsolved murders to ancient artifacts to insane science and space mysteries, and everything in between. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you do not miss out on any future videos. And if you are liking this video, please let me know by leaving a comment or by prodding the like button. But for now, let's get back to the video. The Milky Way is the galaxy that we are currently in. I say currently as if we're going to move out of it. We are probably not going to move out of it. The Milky Way was likely formed in the early days of the universe, and so is likely only a few hundred million years younger than the universe itself. It is called the Milky Way because of the Greek myth, where the goddess Hera sprays milk across the sky, creating the Milky Way. But other cultures actually have different names for it, such as the Silver River in China, and the Backbone of the Night in Southern Africa, which sounds so much better than the Milky Milky Way. The Milky Way itself is thought to have achieved its size and shape by consuming many other smaller galaxies over the years, which we are actually currently doing with a small galaxy, Canis Major Dwarf, essentially stealing stars from this galaxy and pulling them into the orbit of the Milky Way, which is pretty insane. The ISS, or the International Space Station, is the largest space station in the lower Earth orbit. It is jointly owned and managed by five space agencies, those of the United States, Canada, Russia, Japan, and Europe, and is mainly used for research purposes. It really is quite an incredible thing, and whoever goes up there experiences zero gravity or weightlessness. It has these giant solar panels on the outside that actually keep it powered all year round, and it takes roughly 93 minutes to orbit the Earth, completing around 15 or 16 of these orbits every day. The speed of light so in a vacuum, the speed of light is roughly 186,000 miles per second, which is essentially the speed limit for anything in the universe. Don't ask me why the speed limit isn't like 5 miles per second slower or faster. I don't know, and neither do scientists. This is just the universal speed limit for whatever reason. But this wasn't always known or even thought to be the case. For a long time, in fact, the speed of light was thought to be instant or infinite. But starting with a man named Ole Reimer, the speed of light was calculated at, well, an actual speed. So the orbit of Io, which was one of Jupiter's moons, was fairly regular. Reimer measured Io's eclipses, which is basically he started the timer here, when Io went behind Jupiter, so when we lost sight of Io, and he stopped the timer here when we first saw Io from behind Jupiter. Now, this small distance in between, that was the eclipse of Io. He took these measurements all throughout the year as Earth was completing its orbit, and he averaged all of the times out, and he realized that when Earth was closer to Jupiter, as it is here, these eclipses would occur about 11 minutes earlier than average. And when the Earth was further away, the eclipses would occur about 11 minutes later than average. He figured that the difference in time had absolutely nothing to do with Io, as the orbit was fairly standard and regular, but that light must actually have some sort of speed. And so because it was traveling a longer distance to reach us when we were further away, it was taking a longer amount of time. And he came up with a speed of light of 141,000 miles per second, which is impressively not that far off the actual speed of 186,000 miles per second, especially considering 
arguing that this was in the 1600s, a time before the invention of germ theory, steam engines, bicycles, or even batteries. The more mass something has, the lower its speed limit. And so the speed of light is only able to be reached by things with no or zero mass, like photons, which is basically what light is made from. This speed of light, however, is, you have to remember, only in a vacuum, like in space. And interestingly enough, light actually travels at different speeds through different mediums. Like when traveling through a diamond, light will travel at roughly half that speed. Things with even a tiny bit of mass, like atoms, can't quite reach the speed of light, and things with a lot of mass, like us, can't get anywhere near the speed of light, even if we had really good running shoes. While light speed is the fastest speed that particles in our universe can travel, it is still painfully slow over the vast distances of space. A light year is not a measurement of time, but rather of distance. It is the distance that a beam of light would travel in one of our Earth years. And most of the things we observe in space and the universe are thousands, millions, or even billions of light years away. That means that if we were to somehow travel at the speed of light, the fastest speed in the universe, it would still take billions and billions of years to reach some of these far out things. Which, if you do the math, billions and billions of years is slightly longer than our average lifespan of 80 years. And consequently, some of the light that is hitting us now from these far out sources has taken billions of years to reach us. This means that when that light was created, it was created billions of years ago. And so we are really looking into the distant past when we look out at these things. We are seeing light galaxies, stars, and explosions that are essentially snapshots of the early universe, and which, in some cases, probably a lot of cases, likely no longer even exist. The solar system is a zoo is basically the theory that our solar system is a zoo created by aliens. Depending on the theory, they either created the solar system, or they arrived after the solar system formed, and they set up Earth the same way we might set up a zoo down here. They made sure that it had water, that it wasn't too hot or too cold, that it had an atmosphere and breathable air, and they seeded life here. They then sat back, watched us from afar, maybe for study purposes, maybe for amusement, again, much like we do here on Earth, and they occasionally zoom down, suck up, people and cows, and flatten corn for some reason. Tier 2. This tier contains entries that you may have heard about before, like dark matter and supernovas, but you might not have learned about in detail. So let's dive right in. The lifespan of the universe. So I won't go into this entry fully, as it would genuinely take several hour-long videos to cover, but here is the brief history of the entire universe. So way back at the start, before anything else, the entire universe, all these stars, planets, galaxies, gases, solar systems, and iPhones were compressed into a singularity, an infinitely dense, infinitely small single point, which is crazy to imagine. And as for what was before this, even the god of spring doesn't know. And then the Big Bang happened. This infinitely dense singularity, for some reason, and for lack of a better word, exploded and started to expand incredibly fast. At this stage in the universe, there was so much energy compact into such a small amount of space that it was unimaginably hot. And it was so hot, in fact, that atoms couldn't even form, as there was just so much energy and radiation bouncing around that when atoms tried to form, they would be instantly knocked apart by some crazy speeding wave knocking into them. And these waves weren't wearing seatbelts. Completely irresponsible. The universe was actually opaque at this point in time, as photons, or essentially light, couldn't actually fly around without bumping into something. But eventually, after around 380,000 years, which is not that long in universe terms, the universe expanded and cooled down enough so that atoms could actually form and so that light could actually travel 
travel freely. And this light that first traveled when the universe cooled down, we can actually detect to this day. It is coming at us from all directions and is intensely cold, as it has had a very, very long journey. But we will dive into that one in just a little bit. So the universe continued to expand outwards and was filled with these huge seas, if you will, or clouds of gas, helium and hydrogen. This gas slowly gravitated together and formed galaxies along with stars. And when these stars died, well, you've probably heard that we are all stardust, and that's mostly true. The early universe was mostly just a giant sea of helium and hydrogen, and through these nuclear converters known as stars, we have gotten all of the heavier elements and metals that we know today. Like literally all of them. Stuff like carbon and nitrogen, which is essential for our life. These are created when most stars die, with the heavier elements like iron, copper, mercury, lead, and even gold. And the list goes on and on, by the way, all being formed in the core and explosions of giant dead stars. All of these wonderful things that we are so used to down here on Earth. And funnily enough, the very same metals that we use to observe some of these giant stars way out there in the universe were all forged and created in the hearts of these giant massive dying stars, which is honestly incredibly poetic and beautiful. And that's basically where we are today. Our sun was formed around 4.6 billion years ago, along with our our Earth, and it'll probably last another 5 billion years or so. It will explode and become a white dwarf, life on Earth will die out, and the fate of the universe will go on. To what end, if any at all, we have little to no idea. So be grateful for what you have, smile in the sunshine, take the risks you want to take, because the sun will eventually consume us all. But until then, let's cheers to life, and let's make those old giant stars proud to be part of our Earth. The life cycle of a star. So this is something that has always simultaneously confused me and fascinated me. And so I will take you through the life cycle of a star, how they form, what they become and why, and what the ultimate fate for each star is. So as we mentioned before, stars are formed from vast clouds or seas of gas and dust. These are known as nebulae. Over millions of years, these clouds slow slowly come together, and the more dense parts of the cloud become hotter and even more dense, and so they attract more and more of the cloud towards them. This cycle continues until this dense part becomes so hot and so dense that the center of this collapses and actually ignites, which starts a cycle of nuclear fusion, in which the hydrogen in the cloud is fused to produce helium and essentially energy, and this energy that it lets off is immense. Immense. It is, in fact, what is currently responsible for all of the light and heat coming from our sun, and it is what keeps a star from collapsing in on itself. Our sun fuses around 500 million tons of hydrogen every second, so it's no wonder that it has such a lovely radiant glow to it. When a star forms, whatever is left outside of the star forms a disk of sorts. Now this disk is filled with all sorts of gas and dust and other beautiful things, and it's quite a wide spread out disk. So maybe something a little more complicated like that. And at this point in time, this sun is functional and everything in the disk is just orbiting around the sun. And over time, similar to what happened in the nebula, where the densest parts attract other parts of the disk and then become more dense and then attract more parts of the disk, this happens with our disk here and we slowly get the formation of planets. So you got one planet here, one planet here, maybe a gas giant as we mentioned earlier. And these obviously still continue to orbit around the star, and that's how you form solar systems. The planets don't use up all of the nearby matter, as there is still a ton of it out there orbiting our sun that's not part of a planet, in the form of gas and dust and asteroids and comets, such as in the Kuiper Belt, the Asteroid Belt, and even the Oort Cloud, which is something we will get into a bit later on. So after a star forms and nuclear fusion begins, it is in what's known to be its main sequence 
stage. This is the longest part of a star's life and lasts for between a few million years for the absolute largest stars to an estimated 20 to 400 trillion with a T years for the smallest stars, which is roughly 30,000 times the age of our entire universe. So the bigger the star, the brighter and faster that it burns and the more violent its death. Now stars are roughly categorized by color, temperature and size. And as we said earlier, the larger the star, the hotter it burns. And so the hotter the color. It might be a bit confusing because blue and white typically feel cold because you have stuff like water and snow. But for instance, in a science class, if you have a blue flame, that would be hotter than an orange flame. But these are the color categories for the stars. And the letters don't really matter, but what matters is blue for the largest, hottest stars. And this slowly fades to white in the middle, which slowly fades to red at the bottom. And for those who are curious, as I imagine all of you are, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this channel, our sun is a G-type yellow dwarf star, somewhere roughly in the middle of sizes here, and will likely remain in its main stage for at least a few billion more years. Now, while O-type stars, the largest and brightest, are the easiest to see in the sky, they're also the rarest type of star that there is. Is. And we haven't yet observed a planet actually orbiting around one of these. Because they're so large, they go through their entire main sequence cycle and explode after only about 10 million years, all while most other stars are still forming. G-type stars like our sun make up around 8% of all stars that we've observed. And the most common type of star in the universe are M-type stars, the babies of the family. Relatively small, relatively cool, these tiny stars will likely last trillions of years and will give the planets orbiting them plenty of time to develop life and for that life to develop electronics and text messaging and for them to text each other and say just how lucky they are to be alive. Orbiting around this perfectly sized little star, enjoying their life, maybe eating space avocados and then for them to subsequently invent nuclear weapons and to blow themselves to smithereens. Speaking of blowing up, the death of a star. So we've gone over the life cycle of a star, how it's born, its early years as it goes to school, starts a family, gets a job that it hates, and works 40 hours a week, all while paying taxes and running out of hydrogen. Now the star is old and dying and has joint problems. But what exactly happens to it now? Well, that mostly depends on the size of the star. Already drawn sun with inner solar system. A star like our sun will run out of fuel and then begin to collapse. But as it collapses, the pressure that the sun is facing causes an even greater pressure and a greater heat inside of the sun. And with this, it starts to actually burn helium and hydrogen, which causes it to expand into a red giant. And you can't really see this too well, but this is red. Now, this is us in orbit right here. And when our sun does eventually die and expand into a red giant, this will engulf Mercury, Venus, and maybe the calculations are a little close. Just maybe it might engulf our planet Earth. Red. Eventually, after burning itself up, it will run out of all fuel whatsoever, and its outer layers will explode off into space, leaving behind just its core. Now, I can't draw white on a whiteboard, so this is the space behind it, and this is the little white dwarf. It doesn't become a square core. This right here is a white dwarf, a super dense, super hot core of a star. This is essentially a dead star, and it will stay like this until slowly over trillions and trillions of years. It will emit all of its light, heat, and energy, and when that happens, it will become a black dwarf. Now, obviously, since this is thought to take trillions of years, and our universe's age is only in the billions of years, there are no known black dwarfs in the universe. But this is what the mathematics and physics tell us will happen. So that's all fine and 
and dandy, but what about stars that are smaller than our sun, or bigger than our sun? What exactly happens to them? Well, I'm glad you asked, anonymous viewer. Drawn white, red dwarf, red giant, white dwarf, black dwarf. Stars that are much smaller than us are thought to just use up all of their fuel, and actually just skip the whole dramatic red giant phase. They just kind of shrink into what's called a blue dwarf and then they fade into a white dwarf, which of course then do slowly fade into black dwarfs. So these are red suns that are smaller than ours. Red. But this is all currently purely theoretical, as the math and the science all line up pretty well. But obviously since the lifespan of red dwarfs is thought to be in the trillions of years, no red dwarf that has ever formed in the history of the universe has yet died. Now when stars are much larger than our sun, that's when things things start to get really interesting. When a massive supergiant star dies, somewhere between the mass of 10 to 25 times that of our sun, it firstly starts to collapse, and it essentially bounces off of its own core, unleashing an explosion outwards into space of immense, insane force that we call a supernova. These explosions outwards contain so much force and energy that they can actually ignite and trigger the formations of new stars, as is thought to be the reason behind the birth of our sun. These explosions shoot vast amounts of energy, radiation, and heavy elements out into the universe. So the star collapses in on itself first, then bounces off of its own core, then once that outward explosion and energy is used up, it still has the problem of immense gravity that caused it to collapse in on itself in the first place. So it just continues to collapse and collapse and collapse inwards until you get what is called a neutron star. An insanely dense, insanely small star, which you can hardly even see it on this whiteboard. And even this is too big for an accurate scale. They are around 1.5 times the mass of our sun and only about 10 miles wide. So if you can imagine getting one and a half times our suns and trying to squeeze them into a ball that's only 10 miles wide, this is some insanely dense star. Stuff. So with regular stars, you have two main forces. One being the star's own gravity, which wants to essentially constantly collapse it in on itself. And the other being the nuclear fusion or fuel, which is burnt at the center of the star and creates enough outward energy to counteract the gravity of the star. These two inward and outward forces create an equilibrium of sorts and keep the star alive at roughly the same size. Well, the same sort of things happen with neutron stars, where the mass of the star has already collapsed it from its ginormous size, and it wants really to collapse itself into infinity, as the mass and the gravity of the star is just that great. But the neutrons at the cores of these stars simply won't let them. Now neutrons, if you're unfamiliar with them, are basically just one of the building blocks of atoms, and neutrons don't really like being forced together. So when you push them closer and closer and closer together, they fight hard harder and harder to be apart. Much like when you push down on a syringe while you block the hole at the other end. The air inside basically compresses to a point that actually holds the syringe up in a way. So the fancy term for this is neutron degeneracy pressure, but the name doesn't really matter. It's more the process that we are interested in. When the dead star gets to this size, the neutrons are fighting so hard to be apart that they actually create enough outward pressure to stop the collapse collapsing of this star, and you get what is called a neutron star. These are the smallest, densest stars we know of in the universe, and one tablespoon of this star would weigh as much as Mount Everest, or Mount Everest, more than one billion tons. That is insane. So as I mentioned earlier, this is essentially the fate for stars which are between 10 and 25 times the mass of our sun. But what about stars that are even bigger? Well. If you're a clever clogs, you may have already figured it out. The larger the star, the more gravitational
gravitational force it will exert on itself. So when the star collapses from the immense pressure, a slightly smaller star may have become this neutron star. But the neutrons that fought the good fight over in this neutron star, holding the star up, simply won't cut it. They are far too weak to hold up a star of this proportion, and so the star collapses even further, getting smaller than a neutron star with nothing to stop its inevitable collapse. This star will collapse in and in and in and in on itself, and gets to a point where its gravity is so great that not even light can escape its pull. And as you may have guessed, this is a black hole. We'll go into black holes in a little more detail a little later on, but for now that is essentially the life cycle of a star. From start, through to fusion, through to their often violent but sometimes relatively calm deaths. A very interesting topic and I hope I didn't confuse too many of you out there, but if you want to brush up on your star knowledge you can always rewind and watch this again, as I do appreciate this is a fairly complex topic and it's a lot of information to wrap your head around. Supernovae. So we went over a bit about how supernovae are caused from the last stages of a massive dying star. They are powerful luminous explosions and are actually just one type of nova. The name nova ironically means new in Latin as the people that named these explosions thought that they were witnessing the birth of new stars, hence nova, when actually they were witnessing the exact opposite, the deaths of stars. So there are novae, which are caused by two stars orbiting each other. This is what's known as a binary system, and when one star dies and becomes a white dwarf, the two still continue to orbit each other, and this white dwarf can slowly siphon matter and gas from its twin sun, only in relatively small bits, mind you. But when enough of the matter from the alive sun settles on top of the white dwarf, it can sometimes ignite and create an explosion which is known as a nova. Both stars often survive this explosion, then they just go back to normal, orbiting around each other, and explosions like this can happen many, many times within one binary system. Kilonovae are, as the prefix kilo suggests, around a thousand times more powerful than novae, and are usually the result of the collision of two neutron stars, which if you remember are those insanely dense, insanely small stars. And supernovae are even brighter and more powerful than kilonovae and result often from the death and collapse of massive stars. These explosions are often bright enough to outshine the entire galaxy that the star is in, and can last for days or even months, which is just absolutely bonkers when you consider that galaxies often have hundreds of billions of stars. Then you have the hypernovae, which are technically just extra big supernovae, often 10 to 100 times greater in size, and these are thought to be responsible for a lot of the gamma ray bursts and the super large black holes that we see out in space. Quick bonus fact, the last supernova observed in the Milky Way galaxy was Kepler's supernova in 1604, and this was actually visible to the naked eye, and it's kind of a shame that I missed it. Oh, to be born 400 years earlier. Black holes. So earlier we covered how black holes form. Big star collapses infinitely into essentially a void that pulls everything in, light included. So let's go into a bit about the anatomy of a black hole to understand it a little better. At the dead center of a black hole is the singularity. This is an infinitely dense and small point, and it can be argued that this is really the black hole. Let me actually move it down here. Then outside of this, you would have what most people actually describe as the black hole, because, well, it's black, and it's a hole. Let me just add some labels here. But this larger black hole is what's called the event horizon. Now this isn't necessarily the black hole, it's just the closest that anything can get to the black hole before it's inevitably sucked in. So if light travels outside of this, the gravity won't affect it and it'll just keep going on its way. If it gets much closer to this, the gravity will slightly affect it, but it'll still carry on. If it gets really close to the event horizon, it could actually end up orbiting the black hole and form something 
something that we'll cover in just a little bit. But for any light or other matter that is much closer than that, the light will fall into the event horizon and is essentially destined, as it is inevitable, to fall into the singularity. There is absolutely no escape once you cross the event horizon, and so crossing it is irreversible. Hopefully this is all making sense so far. Light can't escape at this point, and so when we look at it, we only see darkness. Orbiting around the black hole is something we call the accretion disk, which is basically just a collection of incredibly hot dust and gas that orbits the black hole at immense speeds and produces radiation that we can actually see here on Earth. Some of the matter in this disk is doomed to fall past the event horizon and into the black hole, and some of it may be spun around the black hole and forced out at the poles of the black hole in these insanely powerful jets at near the speed of light. And this is a black hole. They come in various sizes, and one piece of information that put my mind at rest about these terrifying things was that they don't really suck everything in, any more than our sun sucks everything in. If you are really nearby one, then yes, it will suck a lot of things in, but there are a lot of things that simply orbit black holes, as they would a star or a planet. Which leads us onto our next entry, the center of every galaxy. So this is a relatively short entry, but at the center of every large galaxy, there is what's known as a supermassive black hole. These black holes are the largest class of known black holes, and they have masses up to billions of times that of our sun. There is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and our galaxy seems to be doing just fine orbiting around it. So it's kind of cool, but kind of scary in a way. Dark energy. Is this mysterious energy that is responsible for the accelerated expansion of our universe? So our universe is expanding, but you'd think as it uses more and more energy, you would expect that expansion to actually slow down over time. But it's not. It's actually speeding up. And one theory for this is in something called dark energy, which is the name given for whatever energy we can't detect that is actually responsible for this accelerated expansion. Very dark and very mysterious. Dark matter is another hypothetical dark thing that is mathematically necessary to exist in order for our universe and galaxies to work in the way that they do. So when we tally up all of the mass in galaxies and calculate all of the gravity that they produce, we find that the gravity isn't really enough and that these galaxies should just fly apart. But obviously they don't. It seems like there's some other form of mass producing enough gravity to hold these galaxies together. And we can't detect this matter. So it is thought to be maybe a hypothetical type of matter that only interacts with regular matter gravitationally, but not in any other way. So we're unable to detect it by regular means. Gravity. So gravity pulls objects like us and apples towards larger objects like Earth, right? I mean, that's what Newton discovered. Yeah. He did. And, well, he's wrong. And you are wrong too. You should both be ashamed. To be fair to Newton, that was a pretty good theory at the time. But it's one that Einstein completely eclipsed with his theory of special relativity. This theory basically says that things aren't just pulled towards each other, but rather that the sun, for instance, is actually bending space-time around it, which causes the Earth, otherwise traveling in a straight line, to actually orbit around the sun. And with Einstein's theory, gravity wasn't just limited to large objects. The apple is at the same time essentially exerting a pull on the earth, but it is just so insanely incomprehensibly weak compared to the earth that we really can't notice it. And there's another really cool thing about gravity, which is actually the speed of gravity. So Newton thought that gravity was basically instant or an inherent property of an object. So when it existed, it exerted gravity and when it didn't exist for whatever reason, it didn't exert any gravity. Which again makes perfectly reasonable sense. But Einstein actually proved that even gravity has a speed limit, which is the speed of light. So this means that if the sun were to, at the flick of a finger, be Thanos out of existence, we would still continue to orbit around where the sun used to be for roughly eight minutes, until the updated gravity essentially reached us and we would fly off into space. Kind of crazy. 
tier three. This tier is home to a lot of entries that a lot of people, myself included, have never even heard about. Well, I mean, I've heard of them now because I've done research on them, but before this video, I didn't even know a lot of these existed. So let's dive right in. The Oort Cloud is this theorized ring of icy comets and chunks of matter that is orbiting the sun, but way, way out past even the orbit of Pluto. We aren't able to observe them with our current technology as they are just really, really far out and obviously don't emit any light. But the matter in this cloud is thought to have come from when the sun first formed and it was flung from the sun all the way out to its current orbit. It is now thought to be loosely orbiting the sun. And I say loosely because some of these chunks of matter and comets are actually able to be affected and pulled in by passing stars and by other the parts of the Milky Way itself. So we are slowly losing our little Oort cloud or gigantic Oort cloud. Pulsars. These crazy objects are a type of something that we've covered earlier in the video, neutron stars. Now neutron stars have some super interesting properties and one of them is their immense magnetic fields. These fields essentially funnel and shoot particles out of their magnetic poles like giant laser beams. Now because like our Earth, their rotation doesn't perfectly sync up with their magnetic poles. As the neutron star spins, it tends to wobble a little bit. And so since the star is wobbling, the beams coming out of the star wobble as well. In slow motion, it's almost like they are scanning the universe like giant searchlights. And we only see these pulsars when the light beam is actually hitting us. So from our perspective, they seem to pulse on and off and hence they are named pulsars. Now how fast pulsars spin and therefore pulse will blow your mind. So just to remind you, these stars have roughly one and a half times the mass of our sun and they are, let's say, 10 miles wide and they spin, get this, well, the fastest one observed spins at 741 times per second. Like, what? Something this big, this massive, spinning at even one rotation per second seems insane to me. But four times per second seems hard to imagine. So 741 times per second? I mean, try counting that in a second. If you tried to show that on video, you would need more than 10 images per frame of a standard 60 frames per second video. Honestly, you wouldn't think it because it's just the spin of an object. But this to me is one of the hardest things in space to imagine. Can you imagine getting clipped by that? It would probably just blow your entire being into dust. 741 times a second. It is too quick. Magnetars are again neutron stars, but with particularly strong magnetic fields, roughly a thousand times stronger than a normal neutron star and around a trillion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. Magnetars are pretty rare with only about 30 being found so far, as opposed to around 3000 pulsars being found. And there are six found that are both pulsars and magnetars. Pretty cool. The observable universe is the limit to what we can see right now, assuming we could see all different types of radiation. If you can imagine a giant bubble around us, this is us right here, going out 46 and a half billion light years in every direction. That is the observable universe for us. Now anything outside of this bubble, it is so far away that even if it had been traveling at the speed of light since the beginning of time, it would still still not have reached us yet. And so we can't observe it. Hopefully this makes sense so far. Now I know there are some clever clogs out there who will say, but Connor, the age of the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. So how can the limit of our bubble be 46 billion light years? That would mean that light from here would have had to have been traveling for three times as long as the universe has existed, which makes sense, but there's something that we're missing out. And that is the expansion of the universe. So if you'll imagine for this the analogy of an ant on a rubber band. For the ease of demonstration, let's just make up some numbers. Let's say in its original state, this rubber band is one meter long and the ant is traveling at one meter per hour. So in its original state, the ant will travel from one end of the rubber band to the other in exactly one hour. But what if as the ant is traveling the rubber band, the rubber band gets stretched outwards? The ant is still traveling at one meter per hour, but the distance is no longer one meter. It might be three or four or even five meters long. So what started off as a one hour journey for the ant might take three, four or five times as long. This 
terrible analogy is what's happening in our universe. So I'm going to round off some numbers here just so we don't confuse ourselves. The light we are currently observing from the beginning of the universe was created at the beginning of the universe, so 13.7 billion years ago. The light that is hitting us now was only 42 million light years away when it was created. So we are only seeing light that was essentially really close to us. And as it was 42 million light years away, in a normal static universe, it would have hit us after after 42 million years. But the universe isn't static. As the light was traveling its 42 million light years journey, all of space was slowly stretching out. And so, just like the ant that started its one meter journey, this light from 42 million light years away has taken 13.7 billion years to reach us. As I said, this gets a little complicated, but hopefully this little rubber band is able to make some sort of analogy out of it. And things that are farther out expand away from us at a faster rate rate. The expansion of space has no speed limit, not even the speed of light, and so things that are really far away from us will expand away faster than the speed of light, which means that when light makes that journey from there to us, almost like running on a treadmill, the space around it will expand away faster than it's traveling. And so, it will never reach us. And so, back to our whiteboard, the light that is 46 billion light years away didn't actually take 46 billion years to reach us. And that is how we can have an observable universe seemingly larger than the age of the universe itself. And hopefully that didn't confuse you guys too much. Pretty strange one, I know, but it is kind of interesting. Cosmic microwave background radiation. So, as we discussed before, after the Big Bang happened, the universe was just an opaque sea of plasma, basically. Light couldn't travel, atoms couldn't form, it was just a mess. Then after a while it expanded and cooled down, atoms were able to form and light was able to freely travel. And it is this light from the beginning of the universe that we are able to see and detect. And it is able to give us clues about what was going on this early in the universe. And because this cooling of the universe happened in a much smaller universe and then expanded, this radiation that we see is coming from all directions. The radiation itself is very very cold, being only a few degrees above absolute zero. And so, because it is so cold, it shines mostly in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is obviously invisible to the naked eye. But if we were able to see these microwave radiations, the entire sky would be lit up with this incredible glow in all directions. And it is all from this cosmic microwave background radiation. The Great Attractor. Now, earlier we mentioned black holes, and we even mentioned supermassive black holes, which sit at the center of most galaxies. But what about hypermassive black holes? Yeah, you like that? Just add hyper in front of anything makes it sound cool. Well, these hypermassive black holes only exist in theory, but with this theory, the Great Attractor may very well be one of them. Now, this is an image of essentially what we see looking out into space. The Milky Way galaxy is largely disc-shaped, and we sit somewhere roughly in the middle of it. Now, when looking out into space at anything, stars, galaxies, space bees, we look in these directions, or here, or here, or here, or even here. As when we try to look through the Milky Way itself and out onto the other side, well, we can't do it. The light and matter in the Milky Way itself blocks any light from anything coming in behind it. And so we only see something like this. That area of the sky that we can't see past due to the Milky Way is called the Zone of Avoidance. And this is precisely where the Great Attractor lies. The Great Attractor is an unknown object or body that we know is there, as we can observe all of the effects it's having on everything around it. Warping nearby galaxies, pulling in stars. But to have the level of attraction that this unidentified thing has, it has got to be huge. Some would even say hyper. And so this is where the theory of the Great Attractor being a hypermassive black hole comes from. A black hole bigger than any one we have ever seen before and responsible for this Great Attraction. 
Redshifting is a really cool method that we use for figuring out just how far galaxies and stars are away. So the electromagnetic spectrum is this. And as waves change in frequency, i.e. get more stretched out or tighter together, we define them as radio waves, microwaves, all the way up to x-rays and gamma rays. This colorful part in the middle, that is what we can see with the naked eye. When waves are in these middle frequencies, that is essentially what we call visible light. Pretty cool. So we take something called the Doppler effect, which is when a car going past you goes vroom. It changes in tone because as the car is coming towards you, the sound waves are taking less and less time to hit you. And so the waves are shorter. Then when the car is going away from you, the waves take progressively longer and longer to reach you. And so they are stretched out. I hope this is all making sense so far. So we will focus mainly on the going away from us effect. As we discussed earlier, the universe is expanding away from us and things that are farther away are expanding at a faster rate. So just like how the faster this car is going, the more stretched out the waves will become. The same thing essentially happens with stars and galaxies that we see while looking out into space. The light from distant galaxies and stars is slightly but noticeably stretched out, and so it is shifted, if you will, towards the red end of the light spectrum, hence red shifted. This discovery led Hubble to the conclusion that everything in the universe is traveling away from the Earth, and since farther galaxies experienced more red shifting, that the farther something was from the Earth, the faster it was traveling away. This was a mind-blowing discovery at the time, and it led eventually to the theory of the Big Bang, and helps us measure the distance of stars and galaxies to this day. Just a side note that the stretching of space actually accounts for some of the stretching in the waves, but that is a discussion for another day. Microlensing, or gravitational microlensing, is this cool effect where a passing planet or star acts as a lens for a star behind it. Light from the distant star gets bent around the passing object, and warped by it, creating essentially two images, and magnifying the image of the distant star in much the same way that we use lenses down here on Earth, for stuff like cameras and telescopes. Europa is a very interesting body. It is the sixth largest moon in the solar system, and is currently orbiting around Jupiter, though we may take it back to Earth to study and liberate it, if perhaps we like the look of it. It is the smoothest object in the entire solar system, so it is theorized that below this surface could be liquid water, and with that water, potentially life, which is super fascinating. Scientists have also detected water vapor above the surface, which they believe comes from some sort of geyser, so yeah, liquid water is absolutely possible. And with Europa, we may very well find the first evidence of life outside of our planet. Space time. Boy, this is a deep one, so I'll try and explain this in the way that I've understood it, as it can get very complex and confusing. Space time is basically our reality. It is comprised of the three spatial dimensions, which we all know as height, length, and width or depth. Now it's hard to draw three dimensions on a two-dimensional whiteboard, so as an example for this eraser, this would be its height, this would be its width, and this would be its depth. So this is our 3D universe, but the introduction of a fourth dimension being time completely changed and was crucial to our understanding of how the universe works. Now this shouldn't be confused with fourth dimensional beings or fourth dimensional stuff that people often talk about, as they're typically referring to a fourth spatial dimension, but that's something we won't get into right now. So you have the three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, and these were essentially clumped together in the early 1900s by a scientist named Hermann Minkowski. Now before we continue, I just want to simplify this a little bit. As I said, tracking three dimensions on a two-dimensional board is hard enough without also adding a fourth dimension in there. So we are going to do a little visualization. Imagine a one-dimensional world. So you are on this line 
and that is your entire existence. You don't have two dimensions, so you can never go this way, and you don't have three dimensions, so you can never come out of the whiteboard. Your entire reality is basically this line, and you can go up and down it. That is what a one-dimensional world would look like. So now we can introduce a second dimension being time. So this second dimension will go at the bottom here, and we will label it appropriately. And in the time dimension, we are always moving forward. You can essentially never stop time. And so if you are here in the 1D universe, if you stayed completely still, you would always be moving across the time dimension. And so the space-time continuum for this one-dimensional universe would look something a little like this, where you are always in the same space spatially, but your time is constantly moving forward. If you were to walk up or down your one-dimensional world, you would still, as we discussed, always be moving forward in the time dimension. So it might look a little something like this. So you're moving this way in the spatial dimension, and of course always forward in the time dimension. This can be visualized or represented in a two-dimensional space with a third time dimension. If you have some fancy 3D graphics, but I have a whiteboard, and I suck at drawing so that is not gonna happen. And I do apologize for this light. Here. There's not much I can do about it at the moment. So Minkowski and Einstein essentially worked towards the same conclusion on this, and that was that where something was in space and how fast it was going essentially affected how it experienced time. And that in order to explain where something is, you also had to explain when it is. And this might not make much sense right now, but it will in a little bit. So since space and time are so intrinsically linked, it didn't really make much sense to ever talk about them or describe them them as being separate. Hence, the concept of the space-time continuum, which combined the two, was born. Minkowski had this quote, which I really like, that says, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. He was a poet and a scientist. Now, there's one really cool experiment that we can do, as it's kind of a thought experiment, that will explain this in a little more detail, involving Involving something called light clocks. Feel free to skip this part if your head is hurting a little bit, but it is a really cool and effective visualization of how speed affects the perception of time. So say we had a giant ruler with two mirrors, one on each end of it. This ruler for our purposes is exactly long enough that light would take exactly one second to travel from one end to the other. So this light would bounce back and forth between the two mirrors once every second, and this would make some sort of timer or what's referred to as a light clock. So this is where it gets interesting. The light on this clock is traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. But what happens if we move this clock horizontally? also at the speed of light. Well, as we are moving it, the light will be traveling this way at the speed of light, and also this way at the speed of light. And so, as airplanes do during takeoff, they have a forward momentum with the thrusts of the plane, and an upward momentum via the wings. So what happens? The plane goes up at roughly a 45 degrees angle. And I really hope this is all making sense so far. So our little light beams here, traveling this way and this way at the speed of light, would essentially be traveling at this diagonal angle. But the beam of light would still be bouncing between the mirrors. So as you move the light clock this way, the light beam would essentially travel with the light clock. Then it would bounce off the top of the light clock and follow the same trajectory back down. Now this is where we run into a bit of a problem. A straight line is always going to be shorter than a diagonal line of the same distance. So if the light is traveling this way at the speed of light, how can it also be traveling in this direction as well? It would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light, which we know is an impossibility. So we have this light clock traveling on a rocket at the speed of light in that direction. Ignore the impossibility of this for now. If we were on the rocket, since we would also be traveling at the speed of light in this direction, we would just see the light traveling up and down. Just like when you throw a ball up in the air on a moving train, it just goes straight up and straight down. But if you were someone outside of the train, you might actually see the ball go at an angle. If while on this rocket, we whizzed past a stationary observer, they would see 
see the light in the light clocks traveling like this. But because the light to them is moving diagonally, it is actually traveling a further distance than when it was just moving in a straight line, as a straight line will always be shorter than a diagonal one. Now here's the clever part. Speed equals distance divided by time, as in your speed equals distance, i.e. miles, per time, as in hours. So your speed equals miles per hour. So with this convenient little equation, this is how we figure out speed on Earth. But if you're covering more distance in the same amount of time, that means your speed increases. If you're covering the same amount of distance in a lesser time, your speed also increases. So this equation kind of brings everything together. So with our light rockets, the speed is the same because light is capped to the speed of light. The distance is increasing because because as we said, a diagonal line is longer than a straight line. So that would mean the time would have to increase to compensate. And time kind of does for anything on the rocket. From the perspective of anyone or anything on the rocket, time would be the same. You wouldn't feel anything sped up or slowed down or anything like that. This is because everything is relative. So if the rocket's time was slowed down, you would be slowed down, your perception would be slowed down, everything moving in the ship would be slowed down, and the light clocks and actually any other clock would also be slowed down. This includes traditional clocks, but also includes stuff like your heartbeat, which is a sort of clock, and all of your biological activity. So since everything in the ship is slowed down, while a stationary observer might experience 50 years, because your time is so slowed down, you might only experience 5 years. And since your entire body is slowed down, your body would also only experience 5 years. And so it would really age only 5 years. Now if this seems confusing, Using, that's because it is. That's okay. It's a very, very complex topic and a very hard thing to wrap your head around. And after days of research into this, I feel like I barely understand it myself. But it is an incredible topic to dive into and helps you understand a little more about our universe. GRBs or gamma ray bursts are these huge, and when I say huge, I mean huge, like huge, huge explosions that we have detected in in far out galaxies. They are often described by physicists as the most powerful class of explosion in the universe and are thought to be the brightest, most energetic events since the Big Bang, which is saying something. These bursts shine bright and brief, lasting from just a few milliseconds to several hours. But what are they and how are they made? Well, gamma rays are extremely energetic waves, right up at the top of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these gamma rays are extremely powerful, being roughly a million times more energetic than a photon in the visible light range of the spectrum. Because they are so powerful, they can actually break apart atomic bonds, and due to this, tend to do extreme damage to us in the form of radiation. But thankfully, our lovely atmosphere actually blocks any of these gamma rays coming from space. So how we first discovered these gamma rays from space is kind of cool. In 1963, there was obviously the Cold War going on between the United States and the Soviet Union. They had just signed a treaty to say that they wouldn't be doing any nuclear testing. And obviously not trusting the Soviets, the US sent up a few satellites. And these contained, amongst other things, gamma ray detectors. So they were intended to detect gamma radiation coming from secret nuclear tests. But since these were satellites sitting above the atmosphere, they ended up detecting gamma radiation from space. These flashes were bright and they were brief, only lasting lasting a few seconds at a time, and the information of these flashes just kind of went by the wayside. So it would be another 30 years before we narrow down the source of a gamma ray burst, which was from a galaxy roughly 6 billion light years away. Now because these bursts were from so far away, and yet were still so, so bright, the explosion or burst at the source is thought to have been unfathomably immense. The most common estimate is that these bursts release more energy in a single second than our sun will release in its entire 10 billion year life, which is just mind-blowing. The shorter bursts, those of a few milliseconds, are thought to be the result of supernovas, and the longer bursts, lasting more than two seconds, are thought to be the result of two neutron stars orbiting and colliding with each other, forming a black hole, but also releasing these explosions into the universe. Now, if these bursts are close enough, and they hit Earth, they could wipe out our entire 
entire atmosphere, and with it, all life on Earth. The bursts we have observed so far, roughly one a day, have all been from distant, far out galaxies, and it is thought that in a galaxy of our size, that there might be as few as one gamma ray burst every thousand years or so, and this burst would have to be aiming in our direction, so to speak, in order to hit us or to affect us. So it is unlikely that we will face such a disaster anytime soon, but there are some theories to suggest that a gamma ray burst did hit Earth in the Great Ordovician Extinction, roughly 450 million years ago, in which 85% of all species were wiped out. So much like the mantis shrimp, my favorite animal, gamma ray bursts are extremely deadly, extremely powerful, yet intensely stunningly colorful and beautiful. LQGs, or large quasar groups, are just that, large groups of quasars. So the first obvious question is, what is a quasar? So when supermassive black holes form, they gather what's called an accretion disk, which we discussed a little earlier in the video. This matter orbits the black hole at near the speed of light, and for many complex reasons that I won't get into in this video, the magnetic fields of the black hole essentially channel some of this matter and cause these intense beams to shoot out into the universe. Genuinely some crazy stuff. A little bit like pulsars in a way. These quasars weren't really spotted or identified, for a while, as from Earth, they seem to be just as bright as any other star in our galaxy. But they are not from our galaxy. When they were discovered to be billions of light years away, and yet still as bright as the stars in our local galaxy, that is when they raised a few eyebrows. So when quasars were first identified, they were spotted more and more frequently throughout the universe. As they saw more and more of these quasars, they noticed that a lot of the time, these quasars would seemingly belong to groups of a kind making sorts of patterns throughout the data. These are kind of like ancient relics of our universe, as they are only spotted in super far away galaxies, and therefore super far back in time. And the size of these apparent structures kind of breaks some laws that we've established about how structures form in the universe, and what the limit for how big structures can get is. But this is all pretty new stuff, and there have been theories floated around that these groups aren't really groups, like they're not structurally or gravitationally connected, but it just looks that way from our perspective down here on Earth. Therefore, they don't actually break any large structure laws, but hopefully some new breakthroughs in this can provide us with some much needed clarity. Stevenson 2 DFK1 is the largest star we have ever observed. It is officially and scientifically huge enormous and has a volume of nearly 10 billion of our suns. It is so large, in fact, that it would take light traveling obviously at the speed of light, nine hours to go all the way around the star, compared to only 14 and a half seconds for our sun. It is actually located in our galaxy, and there are lots of large stars out there, but this is so far the largest that we have found. So if anyone threatens to take your wallet from you, unless you can name the largest observable star, then you're welcome. I just saved your life. Tier 4. Now this tier contains entries that are fairly unknown, but that are also quite theoretical. Perhaps even one step farther than theoretical, quite imaginative. So first off, we have quark novas. So earlier, we explored stars, neutron stars, and black holes. And neutron stars are super immense, interesting objects. But what if I told you there was something even more immense? You would probably say, just get on with it. And then I'd say, there's no need to be rude, I will tell you if you just give me a second. <sighs> Okay, so a quark nova is the name for the explosion that happens when a neutron star, you know, the smallest, most dense star that we have ever observed, collapses even further, not into a black hole, but into a quark star, which is a type of theoretical star, which is even smaller and more dense than a neutron star. So to explain this, we need to quickly explain what quarks are. So here we have a neutron, and this is obviously a large part of what keeps a neutron star from collapsing. These neutrons are made up of another particle called a quark, which are these little particles here, connected by something we won't go into right now. So earlier we discussed what keeps a neutron star from collapsing. There are a bunch of these neutrons all randomly together, and when the gravity tries to push these together even closer, they fight against each other outwards and keep the star from collapsing. But it is thought that some neutron stars are in that perfect ballpark of mass 
space, where the gravity isn't quite great enough to collapse it into a black hole, but the gravity is greater than these neutrons can manage. So when the gravity is so great, these neutrons actually collapse. Now obviously when you go from bonds of quarks and neutrons into just a sea of quarks, you have a massively more dense star, as these quarks would only take up a fraction of the space that the neutrons took up. And it is thought that the amount of pressure needed to convert these into these is so great that this event creates the largest explosions in the universe, which as we mentioned earlier are gamma ray bursts. But there hasn't been a quark star observed just yet. And this takes us quite nicely onto our next entry, strangelets. So this one is quite complex, but it is insanely interesting. It almost feels like sci-fi, and in a way it kind of is. As we explored earlier in a quark star, neutrons can actually break down into their constituent quarks. Now at the risk of overcomplicating this, there are a few different types of quarks. The main types are up quarks and down quarks, which are the type we find in neutrons, and a type called strange quarks. Don't pay too much attention to the names, they're really just labels. It is theorized that in this insanely dense concentration of free quarks, in the center of a quark star, there could be these strange quarks introduced to the rest of them. Strange quarks are, for want of a better word, stronger than other quarks, and they tend to form more secure bonds. When this happens, they form something called strange matter, and the properties of strange matter are a little strange and terrifying. Strange matter is thought to be the most stable matter in the universe because these strange quarks are so strong and they form such a strong and solid bond. And it is thought that when other matter with less strong bonds comes into contact with strange matter, that it reacts with strange matter and basically converts into it. So a little bit of strange matter introduced into these quark stars might actually end up converting all of the other quarks into strange matter. And then the entire core would become strange matter. The infectious quality of this strange matter is somewhat terrifying, but since the conditions necessary for this are only in the center of quark or neutron stars, we should be pretty safe until two neutron stars collide. When this happens, a lot of the innards of the star will be flung out into space, and it is theorized that tiny parts of this strange matter could get flung out as well. And these tiny parts are known as strangelets. They are insanely dense, as dense in fact as a neutron or quark star, and could be as large as a house, but would most likely be insanely small, probably subatomic. After these explosions, these strangelets would fly out into space until they hit a star or a planet. And then whatever they hit would start converting into strange matter, almost like an infection. This is terrifying. And if it hit Earth, all the matter that makes up Earth would be essentially infected and converted into strange matter. We would become an insanely small, insanely dense ball. And it would obviously wipe out all life on our beautiful little rock. And if these strangelets hit say, for instance, our sun, it would shrink up into a tiny cold little ball. The mass of the sun wouldn't really change, so we would still orbit around it just fine. But due to how cold it would be, we would all freeze to death pretty quickly. Unless we all wore an extra pair of woolly socks or something. One really cool theory says that just after the Big Bang, when large parts of our then tiny universe were actually as dense as the core of a neutron star, that strangelets formed in huge numbers numbers everywhere. And these insanely dense strangelets scattered across the universe are actually what's responsible for holding our galaxies together, which we have otherwise labeled as dark matter. It's a pretty interesting theory and things honestly start to get incredibly wild once we go into it, but I do genuinely love the quantum rabbit hole. Tier 5, the egg. So this is the only entry in this tier and it's kind of fitting. The egg is a short story written by Andy Weir and can be considered as something like a thought experiment. It completely blew my mind when I read it years ago, and so I will give you my revised version of this story, but the original will be available in the description below. And it starts, you were on your way home when you died. It was a car accident, nothing particularly remarkable, but fatal nonetheless. The EMTs tried their best to save you, but to no avail. Your body was so utterly shattered that you were better off, trust me. And that's when you met me. What happened? You asked. Where am I? You died, I said matter-of-factly. No point in mincing words. There was a truck. 
It was skidding. Yep, I said. I... I died? Yep, but don't feel bad about it. Everyone dies. You looked around. There was nothingness. Just you and me. What is this place? You asked. Is this the afterlife? More or less, I said. I, are you God? Yep, I'm God. What about my kids and my wife? What about them? W will they be alright? That's what I like to see. You just died and your main concern is for your family. That is good stuff right there. You looked at me with fascination. To you, I didn't look like God. I just looked like some man or possibly woman. Some vague authority figure maybe. But more of like a grammar school teacher than the almighty. Don't worry, I said. They will be fine. Your kids will remember you as perfect in every way. Your wife will cry on the outside but will be secretly relieved. To be fair, your marriage was kind of falling apart. If it's any consolation, she'll feel very guilty about feeling relieved. So, what happens now? Do I go to heaven or hell or something? Neither, I said. You will be reincarnated. So the Hindus were right? All religions are right in their own way. Come walk with me. You followed along as we strode through the void. Where are we going? Nowhere in particular, it's just nice to walk while we talk. So what's the point then? When I get reborn, I'll just be a blank slate, right? A baby? So all my experiences and everything I did in this life won't even matter? Not exactly, I said. You have within you all of the knowledge and experiences of all of your past lives. You just don't remember them right now. Your soul is more magnificent and beautiful and gigantic than you can possibly imagine. You've been in a human for the last 48 years, and so you haven't stretched out yet and felt the rest of your immense consciousness. If we hung out here long enough, you'd start to remember everything. But there's no point in doing that between each life. How many times have I been reincarnated then? Oh, lots. And into lots of different lives too. This time around, you'll be a Chinese peasant girl in 540 AD. Wait, what? You're sending me back in time? Well, I guess, technically. Time as you know it only exists in your universe. Things are a little different where I come from. Where you come from, you said? Oh, sure. I come from somewhere somewhere else. And there are others like me. I know you'll want to know what it's like there, but honestly, you wouldn't understand. Oh, you said, a little let down. But wait, if I get reincarnated to other places in time, I could have interacted with myself at some point. Sure. It happens all the time. And with both lives only aware of their own lifespan, you don't even know that it's happening. So what's the point of it all? I grabbed your shoulders and looked you in the eye. The meaning of life, the reason I created this entire universe, is for you to mature. You mean mankind? You want us to mature? Nope, just you. I made this whole universe for you. With each new life, you grow and mature and become a larger and greater intellect. Just me? What about everyone else? There is no one else. In this universe, there's just you and me. You stared blankly at me. But all the people on Earth, all you, different incarnations of you. Wait, I'm everyone? Now you're getting it. I'm every human being that's ever lived. Or whoever will live, yes. I'm, I'm Abraham Lincoln, and you're the man who shot him. I'm Hitler, and you're the millions he killed. I'm Jesus, and you are everyone who followed him. You fell silent. Every time you victimized someone, you were victimizing yourself. Every act of kindness you've done, you've done to yourself. Any happy or sad moment experienced by any human was or will be experienced by you. You thought in silence for a long time. Why? Why do all of this? Because someday you will become like me. Because that is what you are. You are my kind. You are my child. You mean I'm a god? No, not yet. You're a fetus. You're still growing. Once you've lived every human life throughout all of time, you will have grown enough to be born. So this whole universe, you said? It's just an egg, I answered. Now it's time for you to move on to your next life. And I sent you on your way. I really hope you enjoyed this week's episode, guys. Space stuff fascinates me like mad. And as always, thanks for watching.